everybody, what's going on? I am Greg Sussman, joined today by Jim Sonis of FanDuel, who's here to help me break down week eight from a daily fantasy perspective. What's happening, Jim? Pretty good, Greg. I think this slate is slating out, slating out to be pretty interesting because we got some value plays who stand out already and also a lot of injury questions. So it's going to be a week where you got to stay on your toes. And I think that does separate people who pay attention uh, from those who may just be playing more casually. So a good week to be locked in, pay attention to news and know how things are shaping up. So I'm I'm excited for that that type of slate. How are you doing today? I'm hanging in there, man. Super excited for a Thursday night barn burner between the Vikings and <laughs> Washington. Let's get past Thursday. Let's move on to Sunday. We'll begin with your first stack of the week. It's the same well, the same team you stacked first last week. It's the Los Angeles Rams. And, and Jared Goff was okay against Atlanta. He left some big plays out there, and I thought it would be better. And this week, he's facing another future defense. It's the Cincinnati Bengals. And this time, you're teaming him up with Cooper Cup rather than Brandon Cooks. It's Goff and Cup. Normally, the number is better at home, but this home game isn't really home. It's in London, 1 p.m. Eastern time uh, on Sunday. Why are you going back to the well with Goff? Yeah, I would agree that Jared Goff did leave some plays on the table last week, which is disappointing given how good that matchup was, but he gets a chance to right the ship here, and it wasn't like he was missing by a ton. You know, those Gerald Everett missed passes, just a little bit out of the reach, and I think that if we get some regression there, Jared Goff could have a blow-up game in the not-too-distant future, and this is a good spot to do it because both these teams operate at a fast pace. The Bengals are third in situation-neutral pace. That is according to Football Outsiders. The Rams are first, so we're going to see a lot of plays in this game, which sets up well for Jared Goff. And I also want to go back to Cooper Cup here because he's had a couple of down weeks now, but I think this is a good bounce-back spot for him. He still has 27% of the Rams' total targets this year. He has 30% of the red zone targets, which means that when they score points, Cooper Cup's pretty likely to be involved, and I expect them to score a pretty good number here against the Bengals. I also don't mind Todd Gurley paired with the Rams' defense here if you want to go with that stack instead. But I think that Cup's workload is just more steady right now than that of Todd Gurley. So I want to go back to Jared Goff here once again. We don't get the Jared Goff home splits this weekend, which does stink, but we get him in a high pace game against a bad defense. And I think that Jared Goff, pretty close to correcting those issues, shouldn't be under pressure a whole lot this weekend. So Goff, I think, is on the verge of a big game. And I think that uh, the odds that it comes this weekend are high enough where I'm willing to dive in once again. We'll jump right back in with the Rams. Jared Goff, simply more reliable than Todd Gurley, and obviously Cooper Cup, his favorite target inside the red zone. Hopefully we will see a lot of that from London on Sunday as the Rams take on their ex-quarterback coach, Zach Taylor. Another stack that Jim likes this week is with the Seattle Seahawks, something else that we're kind of used to doing. It's Russell Wilson and Chris Carson, and there's no discount here, Jim. 8600 for Russell Wilson, 8000 for Chris Carson. If you want to stack these guys, you got to find some undervalued players, <laughs> which we'll talk about tomorrow, to put in the rest of your lineup. But the Seattle stack, it makes a lot of sense if you could afford it. Yeah, I'm not really worried about value for this week, given that we have Ty Johnson likely in a good spot uh, for the Lions. We'll talk about Kenny Stills later on. There are really good values here. So I think it's a good week to spend up for some studs. And those studs are playing the Falcons this week in the Seahawks, which is always attractive. And when you use Russell Wilson with Chris Carson, Basically, what you're getting is access to almost every yard the Seahawks accumulate and most likely every touchdown. Rashad Penny was fully healthy last week. He practiced in full the entire week, was not on the injury report, and he still did not cut into Chris Carson's workload, which means Chris Carson is pretty much a locked-in bell cow, which bodes well for him going forward. Carson has at least 21 rush attempts in four straight games. He has 12% of the team's targets overall this year, and those targets haven't necessarily been the most efficient because Carson may not be most skilled in the passing game, but when you're getting targets from Russell Wilson, that can cover a lot of ills, and I think that this Falcons matchup really attractive. I would like for Matt Ryan to start this game. If Matt Ryan does start, I think that ups the appeal in Russell Wilson. If Matt Ryan can't go, then I'm also okay stacking Chris Carson with the Seattle defense. So Carson will be involved with the stack pretty much no matter what for me. Just a question of do I go Russell Wilson if Matt Ryan plays or the Seahawks defense if it's Matt Schaub who's playing. So keep an eye on the Falcons side of things here because that does dictate where we want to go at this stack. But if the Falcons are able to score some points, that bodes well for Russell Wilson. And no matter what happens, Chris Carson should have a good game here. But I just like the appeal of getting access to all the yardage and all the touchdowns for Seattle. And pairing these two guys together does get me a long way towards that goal. 
You always want players against that Atlanta defense because they just allow so many points. Russell Wilson paired with Chris Carson. Well, you get a little bit of everything there. But maybe you go with that Seattle defense if Matt Ryan doesn't play. Facing off against Matt Schaub sounds mighty tasty. That Seahawks D, wait until later in the week before you lock this one in. Moving on here, Jim, we get to the Houston Texans, who will be without Will Fuller this Sunday as he's recovering from a hammy injury. Now, we know it's coming each and every year, that Will Fuller injury, and now it's happened as we head into Week 8. So pairing Deshaun Watson with Will Fuller's replacement, Kenny Stills, makes sense because he likes to throw the ball deep. Stills, we expect, will be the biggest recipient of those deep balls. Yeah, that's exactly what he was on Sunday after Will Fuller left because Stills played 95% of the snaps on Sunday with Will Fuller going down, and he had five total targets. But among the balls that Deshaun Watson threw at least 16 yards downfield, two of them went to Kenny Stills, two went to other guys. So half the deep targets did go to Kenny Stills, and when you're at home against the Raiders, those deep targets are more likely to hit, which is why I like Kenny Stills here. And we've seen Deshaun Watson struggle in the past with that Will Fuller, but He didn't have Laramie Tunsil. He didn't have Kenny Stills. So I think that Deshaun Watson splits should remain a bit more steady this time around with Will Fuller going down because Kenny Stills is a very talented football player and can do a lot of what Will Fuller can do. Maybe not as much, uh, but he can do quite a bit to duplicate what Will Fuller brings. So I don't expect Deshaun Watson to take a big step back here. Additionally, remember Aaron Rodgers was playing with a couple of one-legged guys essentially on Sunday and still dropped six touchdowns, five in the air and one on the ground against this Raiders defense. They rank 30th against the pass based on number fires metrics. So I think that Deshaun Watson will be at least more fine without Will Fuller this year than he has been in the past. And Kenny Stills is $5,700. He gets work down the field and he's tied to a really good quarterback. Those are so many boxes to check. Then you add in the fact that he is at home in a great matchup. I want to get Kenny Stills on all my season-long teams right now. And I think it makes a ton of sense to load him up in DFS as well. I will use him as a standalone play at wide receiver. I think he is the best wide receiver value play for this week. But when I'm stacking to Sean Watson, if I can't get to DeAndre Hopkins, that is okay. I will wipe my tears with more shares of Kenny Stills. You saw it last week. Aaron Rodgers decimated this Raiders secondary with, as Jim mentioned, a whole bunch of one-legged guys. This week, well, Deshaun Watson has a lot of players that have two legs, like DeAndre Hopkins and like this super cheap Kenny Stills. This one's a no-brainer, and stacking these guys makes a ton of sense. The next stack we want to get to brings us to Detroit, where you're going to stack Matthew Stafford and Kenny Galladay. It was Marvin Jones scoring four touchdowns this past Sunday, which means it's time that Galladay gets his. They're facing a soft giant secondary, which should put Matthew Stafford and Kenny Galladay in prime position to succeed. Yeah, Kenny Galladay is kind of almost too obvious to bounce back this week. I think people will be on him for sure in DFS despite that dud last week, but It makes sense because even when you include what happened last week for Kenny Galladay, he still has 22% of the Lions overall targets this year to go with 38% of the deep targets. And Matthew Stafford has been throwing deep a ton so far this year. So getting 38% of those deep targets is more valuable in this offense than it is in a lot of other ones. Stafford has also been efficient in those throws, which bodes well for Galladay, whose salary is down to $6,700. Matthew Stafford is 77. And I think that when people look at this Detroit Lions offense this week they're gonna go to Ty Johnson I will do the exact same and Ty Johnson is a great stack with the Lions defense as well given how many sacks Daniel Jones has taken recently so I like that stack and I'm gonna have a lot of Ty Johnson but if you're multi-entering for tournaments you're probably not gonna have Ty Johnson on 100% of your rosters and that means you're gonna have some roster where you don't use him I think on those ones you should be inclined to go with this passing offense and Matthew Stafford and Kenny Galladay this Giants defense regrades as being 24th against the pass the Lions are at home they're in a dome you could worry about you know maybe the Lions getting out front and running the football but I think that given how efficient Stafford has been and given how often he's throwing deep I don't need that many pass attempts for him to pay off. So Matthew Stafford at 77 and Kenny Galladay at 67 make a ton of sense in the Lions where you decide not to go with Ty Johnson stacked with that Lions defense. You're right. The Kenny Galladay situation has squeaky wheel written all over it. It's almost too obvious that Matthew Stafford will force the ball to his number one wide receiver. This one, it's an easy combination to stack and also relatively cheap if you want to do it. Stafford and Galladay Big, big fans of both on Sunday. 
The San Francisco 49ers are one of the best teams in the NFL, and a lot has been because of their defense. The 49ers defense has stepped up, led by Richard Sherman and the rest of the crew. But the offense, it hasn't been about Jimmy G. It's about the running game, where Tevin Coleman, after coming back from that high ankle sprain, has regained his spot as the number one running back in this offense. Sure, he still splits time with a banged-up Matt Breida, Raheem Mostert, and Jeff Wilson Jr. when they're all active, but Tevin Coleman is clearly the bell cow, and you're getting this bell cow at $6,200 this week. We know what the 49ers want to do. Will they be able to be successful doing it this week, Jim? Yeah, it's, a, it's concerning with the 49ers not having their two starting tackles still, Mike McGlinchey and Joe Staley likely still out, and that does matter for sure. But the good thing here is they get a really soft matchup against Carolina. Carolina grades out as being 26th against the rush so far this year, according to number fire schedule adjusted metrics. They've allowed the 31st ranked success rate to opposing running backs, which means that when the 49ers do run, even without their two starting tackles, they should be able to do so effectively, which bodes well for Tevin Coleman. Over the past two weeks, Tevin Coleman has averaged 19 carries and 2.5 targets per game. That's not a great number. Those aren't great numbers overall, especially the target number, but part of that's because they did not throw the football last week against Washington in that slop fest, and he's still $6,200 and getting all that goal line work. So Tevin Coleman, I still think, makes sense at $6,200, and I am very okay with him. And It makes a ton of sense to stack him with this 49ers defense. The Carolina offensive line is pretty good at four out of five spots. The problem is that their one weak spot is at left tackle. And when you have as many good defensive linemen as the 49ers have, they're going to be able to exploit that weakness. They're going to get at Kyle Allen. Allen has had some, tr some troubles with some fumbles this year, which means that we could get some high upside plays out of this 49ers defense. They're not as expensive as I may have expected. They're five and a half point home favorites. Carolina is coming off of a bye, and that does help them for sure. But I think they should be able to put pressure on Kyle Allen, given the issues at left tackle for Carolina. So I think that the 49ers defense makes a lot of sense as a standalone. But I think if you're using Tevin Coleman, it makes even more sense to pair these two together. A really good stack. If Coleman goes off, the 49ers defense is more likely to go off as well. So I think they make a lot of sense to pair together for this weekend. Facing off against a Carolina team coming off a bye, it might be a tough matchup for the San Francisco 49ers. But if they're going to be successful, they're going to need a big game from Tevin Coleman and that 49ers defense to step up, just like they have been. A lot to like here, and this is definitely a sneakier stack, but one to consider in tournaments this weekend. Finally, one last stack to get to, and I feel like we almost close with this every week, Jim, and it's Leonard Fournette and this Jaguars defense. Obviously, a good matchup with the Jets. And Leonard Fournette, we talked about it yesterday with JJ. It's not even sneaky anymore. He's just been clearly good. Yeah, I think he has, like, if you look at, you know, carries plus 2x targets, which is what I do uh, to try to account for the value discrepancy between a carry and a target for a running back, Leonard Fournette has had the best workload in football over the past three games, better than Christian McCaffrey. And McCaffrey, you know, we had the bye week in there, so it's only a two-game sample for him, but that's how good Leonard Fournette's workload has been, and now you're putting him at home where he is favored. That's going to lead to a lot of rushing volume for Leonard Fournette. He has at least 100 rushing yards in three of the past four games. He also has 17% of the team's targets. And what that means is that Leonard Fournette can pay off in DFS without scoring a touchdown. And there is so much value in players who can do that because it gives you safety. And it means if he does score, the dude's going to go off. So Leonard Fournette, $7,700, way too cheap. Even though the Jets' strength defensively is their rush defense, I don't care about matchup. His workload is just too good to pass up. As far as the Jaguars' defense goes, I think Sam Donald should bounce back this week. Last week was just weird. It kind of got out of hand. And you can write that off. But the biggest weakness of the Jets' offense is their offensive line. They've got injuries. They've got disputes with their left guard, Kalechi Osemele. And the Jaguars' strength defensively is their defensive line, even though Marcel Darius is now banged up for them, too. So it is a strength versus a weakness, which means that the Jaguars should be in the backfield pretty often. They should put Sam Darnold under pressure. And I like Darnold as a passer, but he does occasionally throw a pick or two, and there will probably be some sacks in this game. Darnold is a volatile passer, which can be good for the Jets, but it can also be good for the opposing team. So I think that Fournette and the Jaguars' defense both make sense this week. I think they're both a little bit underpriced, maybe not the Jaguars' defense, but Fournette definitely is. Uh, so I think that it's pretty easy to lock them in, especially with so much value elsewhere on this slate. Fournette, not hard to afford. The workload is elite, and this Jaguars' defense should be in the Jets' backfield regularity this weekend.
The offensive line has clearly had major issues for the New York Jets all season long. And even though that Jaguars defensive front isn't what it was with Marcel Darius, they should have no issue getting to the quarterback. They also should have, the offensive line should have no issues opening up holes to Leonard Fournette, who could help you both in the rushing game and certainly in the passing game, as we've seen with Gardner Minshew at quarterback. That's going to do it for us here on the FanDuel Hurry Up. Jim, it's been too much fun today, so I think we need to do it again tomorrow. Yeah, we'll get all of our Ty Johnson love in tomorrow. $5,200, that should be a whole lot of fun and a lot of good value on this slate, Greg. So I am looking forward to it. I will talk to you then. I am super excited to hear where you come in on Ty Johnson, the most popular waiver wire ad this week. And we'll see just what Jim thinks he can accomplish this Sunday against the Giants. We'll have to wait for tomorrow to find all of that out. For Jim Sonis, I'm Greg Sossman. Thanks so much for joining us here on the FanDuel Hurry Up. Have a great night. We'll see you back here tomorrow.